my name is Evan. I teach at the Hangzhou International School in Hangzhou, China. Um, and I'm here to talk about one of my obsessions, which is GeoGebra. Um, one of my colleagues sort of showed this to me um, probably about three years ago. And he was playing with it and doing these really cool things with it. I never really saw much in much uh, uh, potential, really, because um, you know, I didn't have computers in my classroom. I really didn't have a projector. So I didn't see too much potential. But really, I've kind of uh, loved everything that I've learned about it since I really turned it into a fundamental part of what I'm teaching. Um, what I want to talk about first, um, if you go to this website, this is one of my favorite things to do with students. It's a website called todaysmeet.com, and it's a way to kind of have a running dialogue about something that uh, is going on in your classroom. I use it for brainstorming with my students. I use it when I'm just trying to get a whole bunch of ideas from them uh, all at once. Works really well for a lot of the shy kids who are really eager to write something down and have it show up um, on a website, uh, but aren't willing to raise their hand. Really good for ESOL students as well. So during this workshop, if you feel something that I say or something another person says really resonates with you or you have questions on something, please go to this site and put it in there. Um, and if you guys are having kind of a conversation during this whole workshop, that would be great. Um, I think it'll be really good to have a record of um, what you guys are talking about. If there's something you're interested in seeing, I can just take a look there and know right away. Um, <coughs> so this is gonna be the overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. First thing, I'm gonna talk about um, why I felt I needed to change what I was doing in the classroom. Um, and this all goes around the fundamental idea of feedback. I'm not gonna get any more into it because if I do, I will give away the rest of my presentation. So I'm just <laughs> leaving it there. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I use GeoGebra specifically for feedback. Uh, with a few examples of what I do with my students. I'm gonna have you guys get GeoGebra 5, uh, install it on your computers, start playing around with it a little bit, uh, share ideas with each other. And finally, if we do have time, I want um, us to share a little bit about what you discovered, or for those of you that do know a little about GeoGebra already, uh, talk about how you use it in your classroom. Um, okay, so the first thing that I want to do is model another thing that I do with my students. Um, I took a picture of a few of your papers. Um, and I'm hoping that you guys will a lot of similarities in the responses here. Um, so I asked you guys about common mistakes that really make you mad when they show up on a test or on the homework. I saw this one was all over the place. A lot of you <laughs> okay. um, Now, let's see, let's go to a few who had similar variations of that. Actually, yeah, those are almost exactly the same. They are the same. Um, oh, I think you, you see it when the students put it on their paper and you just, come on, we went over this, you know this. But if they're doing this, it means there's some fundamental flaw in their understanding. They're making some mistake. And it's your job as their teacher to help them realize that that mistake is happening and give them the tools to doing that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about these as well. So solving equations, um, how, many, how many middle school teachers do we have? Okay, and high school. Okay, so a little bit biased towards the high school, that's cool, that's okay. Um, so you get all sorts of interesting things here. So we distribute the three times the two, forget to do it to the x, just leave it where it is. We end up, um, we end up with, let's see, this guy right here, solving for x. And this is actually the, the thing that I wanna focus on today. This guy right down here. This is so infuriating to me. When you see a check, and it is meaningless, because it's not really checking what the student, it's not checking what the student thinks they are checking. Um, and this actually gets to the first point that I wanna make about um, feedback. Um, you know, I mentioned that the whole point one of the things that really started me down this road of changing what I do in the classroom um, is because of problems just like this, where you have students uh, 
uh, solving problems. There we go. You have students solving problems, and they're doing exactly what you tell them to do. They are checking. But what they are <coughs> checking has nothing to do with the math that they are learning. Now, um, on a couple of my first lessons, when uh, you know, I, I first started teaching, um, these, these are actual student examples, so I wanted to show that all those examples you guys came up with, um, I, I predicted it, especially with this one. I was so excited when one of our students did that a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Able to show this. Um, in my early lessons when I was teaching, I included that step. I said, students, I want you to solve the equation and then I want you to check your answer. And so they would. And the same answers, the same mistakes about checking and not getting it right would come up over and over and over again. My assistant principal and my mentor teacher said, yes, it's really awesome that you were having your students check. When we were multiplying, uh, sorry, squaring binomials like this, or factoring a trinomial, um, my supervisor teacher said, yes, it's a great idea to have your students check their factoring by multiplying out. But then I actually got into the classroom, and I saw that the arithmetic skills of the students I was working with uh, at that point, I taught for uh, seven years in New York City, public schools, um, the arithmetic skills that my students had were not great. And so I was telling them to check their arithmetic in the algebra, which I already knew they didn't have strong skills in. I was asking them to check that arithmetic with more arithmetic. If you think about error compounding on error, that's a horrible idea. Same thing with factoring. Um, if you can't have students multiply binomials correctly, how in the world are you gonna actually get any use out of asking them to factor? So this sort of thing kind of hung in the back of my mind for a while. Uh, how are we giving these students who have arithmetic issues, how are we giving them tools so that they can get this feedback? How can we do it so that they are not just pulling out the calculator for every single arithmetic step? Because if you watch students who have to do that, it is draining. And they know that, or, or they feel there's something wrong with them, that they have to do that every single time, whereas other kids just get it. And so there needs to be a replacement. Um, oh, okay. Another thing I wanted to point out. So this was something that showed up on the student's calculator not too long ago. Um, I went into the history and I hit uh, second enter two times, and this came up. Um, but I bring this up only because this, you know, this is what we talk about in our classrooms. We just had a great conversation in the Java Lake about what calculators to use in the classroom, what calculators are mandated. Um, inside these calculators, there's eight times the processor speed and nearly 50 times the memory than the, than the computer used in Apollo to get that spacecraft to the moon. Apollo, 12 times three. Somewhere along the line, I am not teaching my students to use this technology effectively. Now, it's possible that they weren't doing this in my classroom but I don't actually think my students use the calculators that much for fun outside of my room. <laughs> so in all likelihood, this was my doing. Why? How are we making the most of technology to help our kids learn? Um, you may recognize these notes as coming from a smart board. I have a smart board in my room. It's great, really good for copying down notes. Students are absent, you can send them there. Uh, they can look at it, really good for ESOL students who maybe um, they want to focus during the class on the language. But this is still 19th century technology, really, because it's writing, and the kids are copying it down. It's a good use of technology, perhaps, because of these other benefits. But this isn't really transforming technology, transforming the learning that our kids are doing. And a similar vein, in this situation, where you can show your kids keystrokes on how to do a specific task on the calculator. Doing that, though, it is exactly what we are doing right now. I am showing you something, and you are sitting and watching. It is passive, and as we saw in the presentation this morning, that is not an effective way to get kids interacting and learning and remembering. So we need to be using technology to be doing something different, to interact with them. Sometimes you have to just deliver information. Sometimes a mini 
mean less and is the best way. But the real question is, um, when you feel this is the only option, can you ask yourself and say, is it really the only option? Because if it turns out, if your kids can just as easily learn a topic watching a video, why are you there? You're, you're not really that necessary. And if that's how you were spending your class time, you don't even have to be there. You could record all your lessons and then go home. Um, and so the thing, I'm a, I'm a huge robotics fan, and so the question that I ask myself during planning a video lesson is, could I be replaced with a robot? And the worst part is when I think my students might actually learn better that way. <laughs> <laughs> not a good thing. Um, now, students are, are naturals at using technology to figure stuff out. A couple of games that I mean, they, they have on their, on their phones, iPads, whatever. Um, they're really good at moving things around on a screen, manipulating, uh, grabbing, trying, getting feedback on how they're doing. But, um, and so if you can use this to help you with your learning, it's a really powerful capability. But um, it also has a negative aspect because I, I don't claim to say that math class has to be um, a game. There are a lot of math games out there that use gimmicks to sort of get the kids excited. Yes, I just solved that equation and I killed the orc. Um, it sort of misdirects the engagement. They're not really excited about learning the math so that they can kill the work. It's passing time. And if that, again, is how your kids are spending time in your classroom, then you have to think, am I doing the best thing that I possibly can do? Um, and so um, math class doesn't even have to be fun. I try as hard as I can with my kids to make it fun. But it should, at a bare minimum, give kids a chance to figure things out, observe patterns, and use technology the way they're used to doing. Um, and here's a final thing, and then I'll be able to actually show you some things on GeoGebra. The other struggle that I have with doing these explorations is my kids would have a really good time. They'd be really engaged, they'd figure stuff out. Oh yeah, I get that um, alternate interior angles are congruent when the, when the lines are parallel, I get that. But then, because of the way I'm assessing them, most of us assessed with pencil and paper <laughs> are required to. The IB exams, the AP exams, it's paper. And so as nice as it is to get the kids, get the students working with these concepts and, and moving things around, ultimately, it has to affect how they do on our assessments. It has to improve their ability to do <coughs> the math with pencil and paper just as it's been done for years. And so that aspect of it is what I want to focus on. Um, this is actually, actually let me, uh, let me fast forward for just a second. This is where GeoGebra comes in for me. Um, I want to mention something. So the order that I'm doing this in is not the original order that uh, I thought I would do this in. Um, I am not claiming that GeoGebra is the only way to do this. In fact, I, I um, strongly believe the opposite. It's what I choose to use, and I will talk later about why I think it's a game changer for a number of reasons. But um, I love Geometer Sketchpad. I used it in high school. And it is still one of the, the nicest programs out there for doing dynamic geometry, <laughs> visualization, all sorts of things. Wolfram Alpha you can use to do a bunch of things. How many of you uh, use Wolfram Alpha actively with your students? Okay. I can show that a little bit later, too. Um, these are great options. But um, I'm just presenting GeoGebra because it has offered um, a lot for my students. and. I'll talk about the advantages later. Um, but specifically, getting to the idea of feedback. These three questions are questions we want our students to be asking any time they're doing our right. math. Um, that top one, <coughs> technology is really good at answering for us. It used to be that you would have to look in the back of the book. And so teachers would avoid assigning the even problems because Okay, all people are going to do is go through and write down all the answers. But if that is how you're assessing homework, um, you're, you're introducing an unnecessary step. You don't need to be part of that process anymore because you can very easily take a problem, 
throw it in to GeoGebra or WolframAlpha, and it will tell you if it's right. Well, we had a conversation in the other room about process. If the computer can talk about that first issue, and maybe the second, but it's really only the best at the first one. If you can target that first issue, then it means your students are coming in the next day saying, I know number eight is wrong. Why is it wrong? I tried it a bunch of different ways and I couldn't figure it out. And then suddenly you have a student who's coming to you and saying, I know I'm wrong. I can't figure it out. Let's work together and figure out what the disconnect is. Um, and this one right here is where we come in. This is the human aspect that we as, as teachers are really good at. This is what we're trained to do. It's not just motivating the material, it's how do we teach them to not make certain mistakes. So, um, I want to start looking at this. Um, so I want you guys right now to turn to someone next to you and talk about the problems that your students have the first time you introduce this. So your graphing lines. What are some of the problems that you and your students run into right from the right from the get go? Let's just take thirty seconds to talk to someone else. Hello. <laughs> Uh, with or without the graphing calculator, 
but it's the exact same process. And they are getting the feedback they need to know whether they're doing it correctly or not. So let's turn those axes back on. Let's go full screen on this. Um, this is the GeoGebra interface. Um, and so here's what I'm going to do. The same way I would tell a student, take your pencil, find the y-intercept, place the point at the y-intercept. We can do that very easily. Okay. We've just done that. And now, we can use the slope and say, oh, the slope is 1 over 3. So I can go, and I'm modeling as a student right now, I can go up 1 and left 3. Up one, left three, up one, left three, and go the other way as well. Boom, 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 boom. Oops. Correct that one. See, let's say I miss it and miss. Um, again, showing some of the features of GeoGebra. I can just take that and kind of put it where I meant to put it. And of course, as you would, you use a ruler to draw straight at, to draw a straight line that goes through all those points. There's a point, there's a point. There you go, Teach. Y equals one third x minus two. Um, the thing that always happened to me when I was doing this is I would give I would give homework and I'd say graph this. And this would be on a Monday, and maybe on the Tuesday I would collect all the homework, and they had done this. They made this this mistake that, that we're all probably <coughs> noticing. Right now. Um, and then I would see their homework because I would uh, try to collect it. I would want to know what mistakes they're making. I'll collect their homework, look at it comments and say, you went the wrong direction when you were trying to graph this using the slope. And then the following day, they would get this homework back and maybe look at it. So I introduced the topic on Monday. By Wednesday, they learn how they've done. Um, again, I am kind of scatter a scatterbrain, but, um, and so, like this isn't a huge surprise perhaps, but I mean, I have trouble remembering things that I did um, even with substantial thought, <coughs> an hour later sometimes. And so we're asking adolescents with all sorts of other, <coughs> let's be honest, more interesting things going on in their <laughs> lives. Than and then we're saying, two days later, <coughs> you made this mistake. Don't do it again. Um, now having this, uh, I, I do teach at a one-to-one -one school, and so I have the capability of um, using GeoGebra in the classroom with my kids. They could theoretically do this at home as well. Um, and I, I really wouldn't have any problem if they turned in, let's say if they made a web page with all their homework and they were plotting this like this. Um, because if they can do that, and then they can come into my class the next day and graph a line perfectly, you know, I'm happy. Um, so we type in y equals 1 third x. Let's say I am that student coming into the classroom and I have just learned how to do this, <coughs> I hit enter. Um, if you're sitting there, and I'm a teacher, and I'm right here, and this comes up on your, on your screen, you're gonna scramble to figure out what's, what's wrong. What did I do wrong? And um, again, if you can teach your students that getting things wrong is part of the process of getting them right, um, they will take the time, instead of just trying to please you and say, like, see, I got it, I did it, look, and very quickly moving all those points onto the correct line, they can learn whether they've done it correctly. And this actually fits into one of my favorite categories of doing this because um, they can make up as many practice problems as they want. Another one, y equals negative 2x minus 6. Okay, graph it. Y equals 3. What's that going to do? Graph it. So you can give your students uh, an opportunity using GeoGebra to get that feedback immediately to know if they're doing things correctly. Um, let's talk about another one. And this, I'm going to get into just a moment like this. Um, so I'm going to clear all these out. I'm going to go into one of the features of GeoGebra. It's not just a, a geometry program. You can teach your kids a little bit about spreadsheets and how they work. Um, another thing that you um, may ask them to do is come up with a table of values. You might ask them to do it by hand. Why? Because that old thing that you say, you need to know how to do it 
without the calculator first, and then we'll use the calculator to generate a set of values. So if you do find yourself in that situation, um, uh, you know, this is something we can do. So if you put f of x equals negative x squared minus 4x, you hit enter, you can get a nice graph that that function looks like. I'm going to turn that off for just a moment. Okay, and I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to model putting together um, I'm going to model what I could ask my students to do. So I'm going to put my function, my x values here, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And I'm now going to do f of this value. I can do that. Drag it down just as you might do with any spreadsheet. A lot of them have used Excel only for making a table to look really, make it look really, really good. Um, maybe in a report. Okay, but this is the true power of the spreadsheet, and this is built in to GeoGebra. And so now what you could say is you have your table of values. Plot this function for me. And so they can go and look and say negative 1, 3, 0, 0, 1, negative 5. And let's say they completely miss it and do something like that. What you can then have them do is look at the actual function and see, oh, maybe as I was calculating these values, I made a mistake. Clearly, that point is not on this graph. I need to check my work. Um, and so that student will be thinking twice about this particular point. will say, oh, I know that if I am evaluating, if I am uh, evaluating this function at x equals negative 3, um, my arithmetic should end up adding up to um, 5, and now whatever else I can. Now, this is an option for, um, I do this, make my font much bigger. Okay, type in f of x. You see that's the same one that I came up with before. Can anyone see, see that? We want it bigger. Just because we can. All right. Um, Euler notation is not necessarily the most difficult thing we teach. It's very easy to do a simple lesson saying, hey kids, if you know how to evaluate an expression, you know how to use Euler notation. But what was really kind of fun this year is um, this is the computer algebra system that's built into GeoGebra 4.2. It's not the version that's out on the front page of GeoGebra, but it is something that um, you can access. Um, it is something you can you can download fairly simply. Um, and I actually told my students, I want you to figure out how this works. I gave them a bunch of examples, and I told them, figure out what this means. And they did it by just entering. What's really kind of cool, and they got a real kick out of this, is when we made things a little more complicated like this, because it's a computer algebra system that's made to do this, it evaluates it, takes care of all the simplification, and puts it all in the <laughs> um, you can even put much more complicated expressions in there. And the kids think magic is going on. They think there's like some trick that, that they're now exposed to, like, oh my god, now I don't have to do any thinking to solve my homework. Yay! But it turns out that um, <clears throat> when you include this as an integral part of what you are doing with your students, um, as you are teaching, if this is not an afterthought, if checking is not an afterthought, they see this as part of learning. They see it as part of instruction. And so um, that's, that's how they are able to learn. Um, another thing. Does it do composite functions? Uh, do you put in two functions? Oh, let's see. Let's make g of x a cubed. And let's do f of g. So much. I think it's because I uh, defined it this way. Um, Maybe point wise. You did it point wise, like f of g of 4. Okay. I defined g of x to be x. They're still, they're still working out some of the bugs <coughs> in the interaction between this input bar down here and what goes on with the computer algebra system. So it's not, it's not totally, uh, uh, totally figured out yet. But now this should. Be. There we go. 
But you could put like G of F of two and it would evaluate yep. G of yep. yep. yeah, yeah. sure. one. Yes, absolutely. Um, <coughs> the spreadsheet works really, really nicely for doing all sorts of things. Um, I'm trying to think. Let's see, I can like wait for doing that. Uh, absolutely. Let's do, let's do that. So we have all this data, and we know it's a quadratic, but let's pretend that it's something else. Um, the graphics here. Now what I can do is I can highlight all this, and I can create a list of points. Um, let me actually get rid of this, and this, uh, get rid of all those points. Um, and so what I can now do, you can see once I've made that list of points in the algebra view, to get this list one that comes up. So I can do fit polynomial to this one. And let's say it's a linear graph. A1, there we go. Now, if you look at that, you're going to be able to tell that's um, probably not a linear, a linear graph. You can see what's going on there. You can very easily adjust that and say, I want to do polynomial of degree 2. And sure enough, when you do that, it's a perfect fit. Um, I'll show you a couple <coughs> things later on as to how I've used this. Um, has anyone caught on to the Angry Birds um, parabola craze that's going on right now. Okay, I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you something that I did with that with my students a little bit later. Um, but it's very, it's very cool, and it involves being able to do this sort of thing. Um, can the students have to memorize that input? They do need to have that. But if you are like the way I usually pose this is, I give my students a uh, a page on our school wiki that has kind of the, the instructions on how to use the relevant command that they need. Um, and I, I am shocked at how easily they absorb these commands very often. They do it, like initially they'll be like, ah, oh, come on, and they'll complain, but then once they learn it, it's very, uh, they remember it. Um, but I've also used this all the way up to calculus. Again, going back to this idea of students making up their own practice problems. The derivatives, derivative rules, knowing how to take derivatives. Um, Go back to the CAS. Um, you can very easily have students put together a function that they want to differentiate. Say, I'm going to give myself a challenge. I'm going to do x cubed cosine of 2x. That's j of x. Um, and then they want to say, OK, I now want to differentiate that. Computer algebra, algebra system can handle it. Type in derivative, you do j of x. <coughs> And it actually gives it to you over here. Um, okay, so it gives you an answer. Um, you can also configure it in a slightly different way to have it do this right here in the computer algebra system. Um, these are the little tweaks that, again, take some time, and you do have to take some time with your students to show them that this is, uh, these are some of the intricacies of knowing how to do this, um, but it's definitely worth it when you can do it. The last example that I'm going to show you, and then I want you guys to actually play around with it a little bit, um, transformations. <coughs> In pre-calc, this is going to be uh, some algebra two pre-calc topic. Uh, transformations of functions. Um, we ask them to do this by hand, and they sort of have to wait for you to tell them if they've done it correctly. They can do it on the graphing calculator, but it's very hard for them to, to see. Like here is the normal function, the current function y equals x squared. And then they see, if you graph that first, the second function, if you do f of 2x, and they see two, this. They don't, it doesn't, it's not super clear what is actually going on with the function. But here, and this is something, um, full disclosure, it did take a lot of, uh, some time to piece this together. But this makes it so that students can actually make their own function. So um, I can take this and actually you know, kind of drag it around and, and change it, make it whatever I want it to be. And I could say, I want to graph f of 2x. So the same way that we have them do this on paper, I go to this point and I say, f of 2x is going to divide the x coordinate by 2. So this is going to be here. This is going to be here. This is going to be here. This is going to stay. And well, let's say, OK, I don't really know what's going to happen there. I think it's going to go through this point down here. Um, and then this point, because this is on the positive side, maybe it goes there. 
And then all I have to do is show them the real answer. Okay, so what I've done is I've included these uh, down in this corner. I've programmed this to work. I could put the B, the number multiplying the X inside the function, put that equal to two. And I can show the correct answer. <coughs> I can do all sorts of numbers. I could instead ask them to do one third. And you see that everything is stretched by three. But the whole point is they can take these points the same way they would do, they might, oh, I got it wrong, erase it and move it somewhere else. Really, really powerful capability. And if you can get the students seeing this as part of the process of learning, um, it changes your classroom. Um, we've already talked a little bit about this, uh, this, this whole issue. I want to show that there are a bunch of ways that you can do this, a um, bunch of ways you can handle this. One way, and it's probably the simplest, is to say, all right, um, I want to figure out whether these two things are the same. So x minus 3 squared. There's that. x squared minus 4. There's a difference. And you can talk, you can have this really good conversation about this is one function, this is another. If those two things are the same, they should be equal at all values. Clearly something is not. So now you're talking about an algebraic representation versus a graphical representation. This is a great conversation to have. Um, you can also talk about you know, looking at these graphs. Clearly, looking at this, um, this is a transformation, this way. This is, a transforma is another transformation that's moving down. So you can talk about uh, transformations as one of the reasons why this is very, very wrong. And furthermore, as you, you may be able to predict, you also can use the computer algebra system and tell your students, okay, multiply that out. Um, X minus three is squared. And it, clearly, that is not what you came up with. Um, <coughs> here are the reasons why I'm a believer in this, and then we'll get, we'll get going here. The learning that goes on, if you can reformulate your class into this sort of thing where they are getting feedback immediately as they're learning, the learning doesn't have to happen in your class. It doesn't have to necessarily happen within the 45 minutes or 90 minutes of your little block period. You can send your students home and say, your job tonight is to learn this. Tomorrow we're going to have a skills quiz, and you're going to show me, can you graph a linear function? <coughs> if you do a bunch of these, you'll be set, and you'll know if you're doing them correctly. Um, and the other thing that I really like, and a lot of the stronger students enjoy this aspect of it, you can say, uh, you can tell them, uh, do five of these in a row. Make them all very different. Make them as hard as you want, and graph them and make sure that you do them correctly. Because if they can handle those, in really good shape. On the other hand, for students that need more practice and need some uh, reinforcement, you can uh, tell them, you, you can either give them a list of problems that you want them to do, or you can say, make up 10 problems, graph them on GeoGebra, or graph them on paper, and make sure that you get the right answer. Um, class time, this is a perfect opportunity for flipped classroom model. Your students can perhaps watch a little video on something, learn to graph a linear function, graph this at home. Come in the next day and you do something uh, like a rich modeling on, uh, modeling program, modeling problem, looking at a bunch of data and modeling it with linear equations. You can talk about slope. And assuming they've gone through this and um, they are comfortable with it, then the class time is spent doing the more interesting, rich stuff as opposed to the procedural. And for those students who don't get it, who say, I'm giving the wrong answer and I don't know why, you have that time to work with them directly. And the other thing, and the, um, I get in trouble with my students quite a bit. Um, parents will write me and say, how do I help my student, my, my child do better? And so there have been a few occasions where I've taught them how to make up problems that they can spring on their kids in the middle of dinner. <laughs> um, I'll just bring it up and the kids get so upset 
but they're also really kind of, like, they end up coming in the next day when this has happened, being kind of impressed. They think, I'm super sneaky. And they also kind of appreciate that their parents are listening and, and figuring out what they're actually doing in the classroom. Um, they're, I teach high school, so they're adolescents, they're not really gonna show it that strongly, but uh, you see it, you can talk to them and you they, they understand that you care when you do this sort of thing. Okay, and the, the final thing, I'll talk very quickly about this, why GeoGebra compared to other options. Um, it's very easy to get, I'm gonna get all of you, if you don't already have it, to have GeoGebra in just a moment. You don't need the internet, which you would need for something like uh, Wolfram Alpha, for example. If you have GeoGebra on your computer, it's there, um, and, and, and you can use it. Um, I've found, and this gets into the all-in-one conversation, the more pieces of software I have students install on their computer, the more likely it is that at least one of them is going to go bad. And so I can't depend on that student being able to have it for doing these kind of learning activities. GeoGebra is one program. They uh, install it, it's on their computer, if they accidentally delete it, I have it on the school server, so it's a matter of just pulling it back onto their computer and they have no excuses. And the final thing um, about GeoGebra is the tremendous community support. And I'm gonna get to, there were uh, some comments um, on the Today's Meet asking about this. Um, and uh, if you want help, if you wanna download the program, the website is there. If you want to learn how to do something, tutorials are all in one place. If you have a question that isn't really posed by any of the tutorials, you can post a question on the forum and someone will help you out. The thing that I really like about it, especially for us, is um, there are GeoGebra experts all around the world who just have fallen in love the way I have with this program. You post a question there and it's 10 at night for somebody <coughs> in the world, um, someone is just opening up their computer with a cup of coffee and they're excited to help someone out with GeoGebra, help someone out. Okay. So this is what I would like to do. And what I'm gonna do in the background while you guys play a little bit uh, is play some videos of my more advanced stuff. <coughs> um, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like you to identify how GeoGebra you are. If you are completely new, okay, meaning just one, I want you to install the program and I want you to play a little bit. So we have a little bit of time for that to happen. Um, I'm here, I wander around. How many, um, Okay, so we'll go for that. If you are a level two GeoGebra user, um, I want you to have a program on your computer if you don't already have it, and I want you to play around and see how you can come up with some usable feedback program for your kids that you can use next week uh, when you go back to them. And finally, if you are GeoGebra level three, if anyone in the room consider themselves GeoGebra level three, meaning you create sketches regularly, you use it on a regular basis. Okay, Richard, one in front. Um, I, I consider myself one. Okay, so we'll uh, perhaps go around and, and help you guys. Um, what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna suggest, because I've tried to put all this in one place, um, if you go to, again, I'm not a super, uh, you're probably not gonna believe me because I have a bunch of sketches with my face in there. Um, uh, if you go to evanweinberg.com and you click on this little GeoGebra link, you can see, um, I put a bunch of links there, um, where you can um, download GeoGebra. So you'll see there's a link here for GeoGebra 4. Um, that's the latest version. If you want to play around with the CAS, computer algebra system, um, you have to click here and it will uh, open right on your computer. Um, I put on, a couple people have commented, commented on this. Um, GeoGebra Tube is a great place to look for inspiration. See if someone has already done something for you. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, you might go there and see there's something, uh, it, I don't like it. It looks good, it kind of does what I want, but um, the ways that I have learned to use this program much more have been saying, I want this, and I'm gonna learn the features of GeoGebra in order to make this happen. Um, and so you can see there's a link there um, where you can see some of my sketches that are put together right here. Um, all right, so let's get to it. So. Let's say about 10 minutes. I want to see what you guys are gonna, uh, what you guys are able to come up with, and then at that point we'll kind of share out. Um, yeah. um, you have the test system of yours. Mm -hmm. The one that I just downloaded doesn't have it. Which one right. You
you want to do the 4.2, so that's going to be this one right here, no, the okay. second one right here. <coughs> Is that still being beta tested? Oh, it's on the yes. website, not on the GeoGebra website. It is there. If you, if you Google GeoGebra 4.2, you'll find a link that will take you straight there. Um, but this will also, if you click on it, it'll immediately start um, downloading. It'll give you this file that you then run, and now you have GeoGebra running. Okay. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is get this going.